Good morning, George. Good morning. How are you? I am well. How are you doing? Very good. Very good. Excellent. I don't know if this is going to be a match or not or what. So we'll play it by ear and see what. Fabulous. What happens? It, it'll be what it's going to be. Exactly. It's nice to see you. <clears throat> good morning. Greetings. Hey, Ken. Hey, Scott. Good morning. Charles. Uh, Merry Christmas, everybody. And to you. Merry Christmas. Yep. Greetings. Hanukkah being over with, but, uh, <laughs> and Kwanzaa being already in progress? I'm forgetting the days of Kwanzaa. I think it starts the day after Christmas, doesn't it? Oh, I forget I Festivus. Right. And there's Festivus, yeah. <laughs> so let's air our grievances. I saw, I, I saw a tweet from Seinfeld saying, uh, just this year, let's, let's pass on airing the grievances, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Good. Good point. As I like to say, I love Festivus. He was great in Gunsmoke. <laughs> <laughs> so I grew up in South America, and there's a, a bunch of funny things that that um, get translated funny, right? So so we watched Bonanza, and I don't know what the name of the young handsome guy was, but for to me he was Bucles de Oro, which means Goldilocks, which I assume is what his name was. <laughs> little Joe. Yeah, little. Okay, so 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 to me he was Bucles de Oro. And to me, uh, the soap used in the kitchen was palmolive, so palm olive, right? <laughs> um, and there's a couple others like that where, where like my pronunciation is just totally different. It's the, the, the what way they call Haas. Uh, I don't remember Haas. I mean, he might have just been Haas or something. Like that. I don't remember. Mm. I, mean, I think he had a different name, but it wasn't actually, as fancy as Bucles de Oro. Hey, I Judy. actually met Michael Landon when I was a little kid. Oh, cool. Yeah, I went to a, a circus and he was there and, I, you know, stood in line and waited and he signed his picture and it was a big deal for me. Mm -hmm. Cool. It's very cool. It's been all downhill since. Well, we're having <laughs> the traditional extremely cold after a snowstorm day today. Mm. So when I got up this morning, it was minus three. Where are Minnesota. you? Minnesota. <laughs> What are you getting in interlock and did you get the edge of that storm? Yeah, we, we went from uh, uh, mid 40s to uh, low 20s overnight. Mm -hmm. It was a beautiful walk this morning through the quiet woods. The snow is coming down and yeah. Well, we had a nice. blazing blizzard. I mean, 40 miles oh, an wow. hour, wind white out, wow. closed, <clears throat> eight inches in some parts of the state and literally howling wind in front of the house. But we only got actually about two inches here in, in Woodbury. So that's not very substantial. In New, York, in New York, it was uh, uh, about 18 degrees last night and 55 degrees now. Oh, wow. <laughs> that's Amazing. Funny. And we've got, we've got 35. It just keeps wanting to snow, but hasn't. And there, there's a little bit of snow possibly in the forecast in Portland, Oregon. So mm -hmm. crossing our fingers. I like it when it snows here. It doesn't snow every winter here, but it does snow on occasion. In Zurich, it's it's uh, breezy and balmy, and it rained all night heavily, and uh, sort of sprinkling today. But uh, I'm sure the mountains are getting dumped. Yeah, but and you haven't had snow yet this season. In Zurich, we had a little dusting, um, but not barely nothing that was sticking. But but uh, you just you know, there's sort of hills and little mountains. We're sort of seated amongst lots of jutting up and, and you go up just a little bit and uh, and then there's some snow, but down yeah. down in the city by the lake, uh, nothing. Fascinating. Yeah. My, my stereotypes um, are being blown. I just learned about something very cool that I've sent a couple of people here. Um, it's called intersections, plural, sciencefellows.com. And it's specifically a mentoring program, including a high talent person symposia of postdocs on the verge of academic seeking appointments. And it's focused on diversity very strongly. Um, and it's a consortium of about 25 universities on the East Coast. And it's modeled after, or they say inspired by several similar programs, some on the West Coast and so forth. That sounds um, super useful. It's really, the content is really high caliber. And the only reason I know about it, and this is mom bragging, but my daughter just found out two days ago that she was selected as a fellow and I'd oh, never fabulous. heard of the program. <laughs> That's and great. So, 
and she actually didn't know that much about the program. I mean, she just applied to see what happened, kind of. Yeah. And um, much to her pleasure, she was selected. But now it's like a whirlwind pace because first they send you the letter and they need an information form for you with a bio and a photo and other stuff like that. And then as soon as you send them that, then they come back with, well, now here's the next things that happen. And we've assigned this person to be your mentor and you're supposed to meet with them twice next week before the symposium on the 6th to the 8th. And <laughs> it's just, boom, boom, boom. it's like a fire hose. Yeah. What was the name of it again? Intersect, I'll, I'll paste, I'll type it and paste Perfect. it in. Um, it's so called much. Intersection gonna, Science Fellows, plural. I'm going to jump in and say um, congrats uh, to your daughter, Judy. And um, I think Lauren is planning to come, but she's uh, visiting some friends today. Um, Lauren and I, Kiko Lab, got into a fellowship actually just uh, <laughs> just yesterday. I mean, we had, oh, it wow. kind of came up quickly and um, it's similar to Judy, what you just said. I don't know yet that much about it, but it is also, it's an eight week program that begins on the 12th of January. So we're gonna be like in this tunnel mode, I think a bit. And um, it's, it's uh, Gitcoin, it's something called kernel. K-E-R-N-E-L, -E um, relating to Gitcoin, Ethereum, blockchain, it's sort of Web3 decentralized uh, tech stuff, and they're waiting heavy on women, which is why we got in, because Lauren's a superstar. And um, so that's some news we can announce, and we just uh, heard the affirmative, so that's exciting. That's fantastic. Great. Yay. You'll be hearing more. <laughs> Yay. That's good. Love that. Awesome. Um, awesome. I'm, I'm sharing something that, that I discovered in the middle of the night last night. So I've been looking at the history of words as I'm developing my thinking skills program. And I've been using this resource and really enjoying it. And last night I checked on the about page. It was created by one person. They made their, they made a dictionary. And this is the little story of of how they came to do that. And they just made it. And I just think that that's wonderful. And they said, well, you know, they, they did it because they wanted it to exist and they didn't have any expectations beyond that. And, and it's just, I don't know. I think it's a, it, it's very OGM-y. Because <laughs> it's an that site for Boston. years. I had no idea that it was made by one person. I've been using that site for years. Same here. Same here. Um, thank you. I will. Uh, what site is that again? It's in the chat. The link in the chat. Uh, check the chat. It's etymo online, online etymology dictionary, but the URL is etymonline.com. Um, and I love etymology. I just love insects. <laughs> you really <laughs> bug me with. <bit. laughs> <laughs> that was for Ken, our pun meister. Yes. That's, um, that's, I, I might have told that story before, but in, in high school, my, I, I think it was like end of the year and it was a little party um, and I, my biology teacher was there um, and I had gotten into like a summer program and I was going to take an um, etymology course and he heard me say entomology and he was all excited, but yes, it was about words, not bugs. <laughs> Love that. I've got some favorite etymologies. And, you know, too bad Doug's not on the call because he is the master of word origins, mm. that, word origins that matter in some way, like that matter to the quest to figure out how to fix, uh, how to fix the world. Well, as I was trying to translate some of the higher level concepts into language that kids could understand, I found that the older words were the better words. It just was a pattern. It was interesting that that when I was looking for the right word, normally I would go to my powerthesaurus.org because I, I love that. But using the, you know, looking at the history of the words, I found I wasn't expecting that, but but the older words were richer, were were easier to understand. Um, you know, something like point. You know, it just has, it has all these, these rich connotations that, that come with it. Mm -hmm. And, and I also was surprised to find that a lot of words actually are a hundred years old and that's it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and not just, you know, like, like hip lingo. I'm talking about like 
words that that we use every day. And I thought, really, that's I can't think of a good example, but um, it was just surprising that that you know language is is alive, right? There's a yeah, there's a whole bunch of things like uh, red and blue for boys and girls used to be flipped. Uh, red, red and pink used to be boys color and blue used to be girls color some years ago and some weren't flipped. I don't know why or how. Hey, Eric, hey, Jillian, hey, Mark Anton. Hey, Hello. Hi. Um, Even the word good. nice, uh, the word nice at the end of 1800s meant the opposite of how we use it today. Yeah. Hmm. Um, uh, I'm going to dig out a link from Susie Dent, who's a, uh, whatever the word is for a person who studies words. Uh, and I'll put it on the chat as soon as I get it. So. Yeah, nice. I, I actually looked into that some years ago. Um, I, I had I knew someone that was really um, hardcore against using that word nice and used to like chastise anyone that would use it and give them a whole like speech about what it really meant. <laughs> that was nice of her. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> one, of my, one of my favorite word origins is uh, in a nutshell. Uh, and that's a, not a word origin, but a phrase origin. But I, I, I go back and forth between phrases and words. But in a nutshell, it comes back from the days of illustrated manuscripts when you had scribes basically recopying texts. And it was a test of skill how small you could write. So <laughs> one of the tests was, could you write the Gospels, the four Gospels, as so small they, they would fit in a nutshell? Cool. And then uh, another sort of religious one is sub rosa. Anybody know what sub rosa means? So uh, sub rosa means in secret, right? I've yeah. told you something sub rosa. Mm -hmm. uh, it turns out that the Virgin Mary is the symbol or the patron saint of the confessional that in many confessionals on the ceiling, you will find a white rose because the white rose is the symbol of the Virgin Mary. And therefore anything told to you or that you've told someone uh, in the confessional is sub rosa, is under the rose. Mm -hmm. mm. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. To, to, to the question of uh, simpler language, I mentioned the uh, Uncliftish beholding. It's uh, exercise, uh, exercise of style by Paul Anderson, actually, trying to describe uh, modern concepts using only core Saxon, Anglo-Saxon words, no oh, Latin language, mm -hmm. no nothing derived from Latin or Greek, which wow. is... Uh, yeah, then um, so uh, I don't know if you can guess if uh, so. Beholding to behold is from is the is equivalent to science uh, because science has come from Latin and uh, uncleftish. So to cleft to cleave, of course, is to divide. So uncleft is undividable, which me which is his translation of atomic. Mm. Because toma toma is to oh, cut in Greek. Right. <laughs> Um, atom is the undivided. <laughs> which brings me to the difference between science and religion. Science comes from scissors, comes from cutting things apart, sort of analysis. And religion comes from legio, which is a bond, which is, and religio is the reconnecting, the remaking of bonds. That is contested etymology. Then we oh. get into folk etymology. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. All right, go ahead, Scott. Um, so to give you some context for the reason why I was looking at etymology sites at three in the morning. Wow. I could, I, well, I couldn't sleep. And it's because I wake up and I'm working on this project, which I'm considering my magnum opus, I think. Um, I'm gonna paste something into the chat. And this is the, uh, this is the latest iteration of the structure of my, my thinking. <laughs> Well, yeah, my, 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 my thinking skills for kids um, system. And wow. to, to go oh. through, so to go through it, the, it started with, um, you know, there's, well, learn, learn, make and play. Those are big buckets said in a different way, systems thinking, design thinking, narrative thinking mm. said in a different way conceptual, practical, purposeful, putting them all together in a single line, you can see how they link, learn, systems thinking, conceptual. And then all of the nine that are there are learn, try, decide, remember, et cetera. Those are all the simple word attached to the actual D 
deep word. And my frustration has been that most of the people that I know that are really, really amazing at this stuff and deep into it tend to use the words on the right. They talk about systems and divergent and neural networks and distributed cognition. And the average person is like, I don't even know what this is. And I'm trying to translate it into, no, these are things that you actually do and use. Mm -hmm. And if you were to learn them when you were young, they would serve you your entire life. And so just to run quickly through them where I've landed, the first lesson is about framing this as metacognition. I thought up last night, it was kind of funny that your MC is MC, metacog. <laughs> um, anyway, so you're thinking about thinking. And then as you, we go through them, the systems thinking that I follow is the Cabrera model of distinction systems, mm. relationships and perspectives, because I think it's simple and they can, they've can they proven that they can teach it at the, the elementary school level. But just very quickly, not to take over the call here, um, try divergence. So try is like my simplest word for creative um, because you're experimenting. Decide coming back down to your and to take taking many down to to a few remember is everything that's going on in here that's unprompted so your ability to remember recall use your uh you know your your recall curves and the way that memory will fade over time and and peg words and roman room technique and you know all of those things that appear remind is everything outside so that's your notes it's your computer systems, it's your whiteboard, all that stuff. Draw, so that's the semiotics, that's signs, uh, visuals, meaning in symbols. Describe is language, so it's either going to be oral or written, so that's actually words. Play, the verb, is you play a game, so games are rules and a goal and challenge, you know, those things. And then plays, the noun or play a noun is a story. And I've, uh, I've complained with the idea that a, that a game is actually a story now and a, a story is past or future, but a game is, 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 is actually a story now. And then the last bit is the story of you, which is that unique story that's unique in all of history that you can write and change and, and that's your agency. So is that's this my for elementary school students. I'm sorry, what? This is for elementary school students. It was it was designed for elementary, middle that that kind of area to try to equip them with thinking skills, which instead of the, the typical learn learn the information for or absorb the information for the test, we're not actually learning how to approach new things and and this is well I applaud, I applaud you I think this is wonderful things that I mean the the almost 98 percent of, of of education I speak as a former school psychologist in another in another life um, almost all of its content almost none of its process as you know and and we just don't teach kids how to think and what we think we are teaching them how to think is not thinking and all these other functions. Uh, it's phenomenal. Well, thank, thank you for that. I, I appreciate that. This is 25 years of hobby. And what happened was I, I thought it was fun. I thought it was interesting. I taught my own kids similar things. And then it wasn't until recently that I realized and have been seeing like some of Jerry's videos on, on education and talking to my daughter who just started as a middle school science teacher. And she's explaining, no, exactly what you said, George. Mm -hmm. And I, I said, wow, I didn't realize things had changed so much since I was in school. And she said, I was in school 10 years ago and it wasn't like this. And so um, it's, it's given it a, an impetus, I think, that's really This important. is absolutely the time for it because now we have all the thought tools. You know, we've got the brain, we've got the Rome, we've got 
There's a, there are dozens of other, literally dozens of, of uh, what you know, Steve Jobs called bicycles of the mind. You're all familiar with that, I assume, right? The, the bicycles of the mind analogy is just mind blowing. Can I? And I would just, I would just uh, commend Scott. Also, you didn't mention you've come over to the Clue Laboratory, the Kiko Lab um, Kids Gathering, and uh, try some of this out. And it's, and it, I think right away it was pretty profound. Also for us as, uh, as the guides, the facilitators. So we look forward to more of that for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought you you just did one lesson in in some rigor with the group probably six weeks ago, and it went really well. I thought. Um. I'll frame that. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, Charles um, and, and Lauren for letting me do that and share that stuff. I'll frame also the, I'll, I'll put something in the chat. I don't know if I have it handy though. I, I, the other part that goes along with is how this is taught. So I came up with this 5, 10, 15 module structure. The idea is Normally, if I had a 30 minute class, I would make 25 minutes worth of content and then you do five minutes and stuff. And I, I read something and I realized that was exactly opposite of what it should be. And so what I, I came up with is I need to be able to teach all of these in five minutes. If I can't teach one of these concepts in five minutes and, and each one of these has little, little sub tools that comes with it that you'll see later. But the idea here is that Five minutes, here's what this is. Distinctions. Distinctions is, is the dividing line between what something is and what something isn't. And it's always chosen by an individual. All right, so da, 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 this is distinctions. Mm -hmm. 10 minutes is now you go away with that concept with a little bit of a prompt and you work with it for 10 minutes without much direction from, from anything. All you have is a slight introduction, but because you understand it, you're able to mess around with it a little bit. And then 15 minutes, we come back together and we talk about what, what happened in the 10 minutes and we extend it and expand on it and say, oh, well that's, you know, we understand how distinctions can apply to different other areas. And then we start to say, oh, that could be combined with these other tools. And so it's a very, interactive working with what you just learned instead of giving you a lot of content that you are then kind of like a you know a bucket that we pour it into you're actually going to give you something small and actionable that actually has high leverage and then we're going to work with it so that you're able to actually engage and and, and remember it um, so that that's kind of the other part Process over content. Yeah. Can I add something to it, Scott? Go ahead. Uh, so do, do you know thinking at the edge as a system? Uh, there's like focusing by Eugene Chandler, uh, which is uh, a therapeutic method where you often use images to describe how you're feeling. And often it's very slow and it's trying to uh, describe the implicit or the felt sense. And the implicit and the felt sense is something you feel, but you don't necessarily have words for it. It, ca it can be a very rich kind of field of understanding. Yeah. Let and me offer the, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, please finish. Yeah, and, 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 and I think it ties a bit into like, if in knowledge management, you've got like stock and flow. Uh, stock is what you can, think of and what you can name and what is it possible in words and flow is the kind of information that's more, more difficult to put into words and you'll learn by doing. And I think those two together, they might add to what you already were explaining. And it's because I'm, I'm like a mime artist, I, I do a lot of music. And for me, there's also a way of thinking, which is not the words thinking. And it's not the, the mind making divisions and categorizing. It's actually something about how you creatively come up with things that's beyond, even beyond your thinking, but it is also part of thinking. It's not really describable where it comes from, but it is, yeah, all these kind of concepts, I think might, yeah, might add to what you're already working on. 
I, I agree with you. And one of the areas in, uh, in the, uh, the draw, the semiotics especially, is about using, using very simple visuals. So this is every problem. Yeah. And <laughs> this is basically every game. You have a goal, you have rules, you have a challenge, you have an action. Mm -hmm. And those sorts of things are along the lines of what you're describing in that they're not, they're, they're pre, they're pre-verbal. And um, I don't have anything that's, that's motion oriented other than uh, walking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, yeah. I, I, Doing, planning, all that stuff. I, 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 this, and this may be helpful to you. I divide conscious mental functioning into five simple areas. The, there are the thoughts or thinking, feeling, remembering or memory functions, imagining the creative functions, and doing action, regulation, monitoring of action. So there's five different areas. And I, I would urge you to go beyond just thinking into these other areas because most of the major things we're trying to do, like problem solving, and decision-making involve all five areas. And if they don't, if one area is missing, the process is deficient. Does that the, make sense? It, it does. And, and the design thinking aspect of this, the, the central, the make portion, is actually from the uh, divergent ideation to the convergent decision prototyping test feedback. Um, and I got a little hung up on including an operations type section. And I, I thought the, my audience at this point, the most sophisticated thing they might be doing, I'm guessing is going to be a project and a project. So it's not necessarily, a, you know, it's not an operations type. It's, it's a project that's going to have a, a, a finished thing Goal. And and I thought, okay, so part of distributed cognition is tracking your projects, tracking your statuses. That is something that I think I've done it with elementary school kids. And wow. beyond that, I think it, it, I agree with you, but it, it feels like that might be something that, that comes later as their project work becomes more sophisticated in their life. And, but I don't know. I think you're right, though. Another thing you might want to think of is I discovered in the third grade that my hobbies were teaching me more than my school. And that was a profound lesson. From the third grade, I was more focused on process than I was on content. And it served me very, very well. I heard somebody years ago say that if you want to find out what you're going to do as an adult, go back to what you were doing when you were 14. <clears throat> like, like, somehow by the time you're 14, you've, you've materialized some thing that matters a lot to you that you're maybe obsessed about, uh, whatever it is. But 14 is kind of this age where you're often in that kind of sweet spot. I was um, a magician. Oh, perfect. And I, I, I want to take us back to this notion of a retrospective in a second. I kind of uh, let us wander here into really interesting space because I love our conversations when we wander. Uh, Ken, did you want to throw something in? Yeah, Scott, there's there's one thing that I'm, I'm curious about. Um, my teacher um, talks about matriculation. So he'll teach me a move and um, I have to practice that move for some time before it matriculates to my body becomes part of what my repertoire of move, moves are. And part of that is rest. And part of that is, um, so I'm, I'm the, what I'm curious about is this all seems to be moving in an action direction. Where is the resting point, the Shavasana that lets it integrate and so there's so the the my, I believe in the creative the, the neurological neuroscience creative models not the advertising creative models and so incubation is a critical part of that and that means not working on the thing and so mm -hmm. I'm going to use that as the small end of the wedge to include things like meditation walking 
things that take you away from the problem. In also, order to include, also include sleep. Rem- oh, it's sleep. I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, George. Also, also include reminiscence, which is the, the uh, I think that's the word, um, the improvement of performance without practice. Oh. And, and, and other every, every, every musician knows that phenomenon. You go yeah. away and you can play it better the next day. Mm-hmm. Right. Go ahead, Eric. And, and one concept a bit beyond kind of thing, weird kind of thing, but it worked for me to understand something. It's uh, the Nagual and the tonal, as described by Castaneda. That's like the tonal is what you know and what you understand and what's been put into boxes already. But then the Nagual is uh, everything we don't know. And some of that you can put words to and other parts you might not even be able to put words to or even know because it exists beyond our uh, perception. Just wanted to name that one. Excellent. Um, I let's, this seems like a good moment to head back toward and Julian is showing images. Julian, do you want to describe what that is? This is the cover of a book I, that I got during my introduction, my employee um, orientation at Lego. It's, I'm not sure if it's showing up. It's called Play, Children's Most Important Work. Oh, cool. And wow. uh, it uh, talks about the process of, it's part of why Lego bricks were so successful, right? And one of the things I wanted to bring up with Scott was that uh, the, the 5, 10, 15 thing seems too pat, because as we know, learning is a subjective process. And minutes have nothing to do with human evolution. So one thing I was going to bring up was uh, that the numbers are just so nice, right? And, you know, if they are really suitable. And then the the other is really the importance of play. Because after all that time at Lego, it's like it was so clear as to what that visceral experience brought to the human process. Um, And then my two quick contributions to Scott's quest. And I think... Also, talking about, Scott, what you're doing and how to materialize it would be really good for next week's call in terms of what are we going to do, like looking forward, because it feels like a very much a looking forward project. Uh, but two things I would, I would think of. One is that kids love hard fun, that, that, that it, fun doesn't need to be simple and, and quick and easy. Uh, and the other is that in the Venn, di- Venn diagram of life, we somehow separated learning, uh, work, and play. And those things have separate parts, parts of our lives. We're supposed to be in the, like the learning, the work part, and then you get to retire and play. And then our day parts are all separated, learning, work, and play. <clears throat> and from, to me, really good learning while working is play. And to me, the, the Venn diagram should be a big circle. And we should, well, we should be playful in our learning most of the time, if at all possible. Go ahead, Judy. I was just going to say that for me, learning is play and it's been a lifelong thing. I mean, there's nothing that gets me happier and joyful than learning new things. And I have an insatiable curiosity about just about anything. So every, every once in a while, someone would say, well, you, you're, you're really giving up a lot working all the hours that you're working. And I said, I'm not giving up anything. I'm doing exactly what I wanna do with my time. And it was a foreign concept to that person who viewed work as work and play as play. And it's, we've managed what, to segregate both, those in our lives. Go ahead, so, Julian. But I yourself. just had to throw uh, it in because it's just so close to my core values. But actually, what both of you said, you remember that old saying about find something you love to do and you'll never work a day in your life? So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. Scott, and then I'll turn us back into a retrospective mode. Um, so I had originally had learn, work, and play, and I ended up changing it to learn, make, and play because make, it's the same thing in a sense, but it didn't have that negative weight. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, uh, Julian, thank you for that, that call out about the 5, 10, 15. I needed to make some kind of structure. And I think it's more philosophical than it is prescriptive. Um, it's let's a short introduction, lots of interaction as opposed to the opposite. Mm-hmm. And and I, I agree with you that it is, you know, it has to flow, right? That that has to work. And maybe and, it gives kids a, a rhythm to count on or to predict or to. Uh, you know, or the, I think the five is the most important, <laughs> and yeah. then we're going to go away and talk until every, uh, you know, work on it until everyone seems to be bored with that, and then we're an important come point back together. Scott, because now that I think about it, the reason I'm probably ended up in the sciences is because you get to play all the time. I mean, they do things. 
you know, and you're doing things you enjoy and it's a puzzle because you don't know how it's going to turn out. And so it was, I didn't ever think of science in that particular mode, but in this discussion, I'm going, oh, that's cool. That worked out just fine. <laughs> you know? yeah. and, uh, Julian, could you put the Lego book title in the chat um, so we can capture that? Uh, and then this conversation is reminding me of my favorite teacher in grade school who was in Argentina in Buenos Aires, where I went to the Lincoln School, believe it or not. Uh, and his name was Daniel Reyes and his, he was fabulous. And he would stand at the door and like everybody would run into class. And we, when, we, when we got into class, we would grab all the little chairs and jam them up against his desk. Like all the desks, all the, you couldn't get up and leave. All the chairs were jammed up against his desk, leaving him a little path to stand at the chalkboard, chalkboard and write. And then, and then his MO was basically he'd work us up. He'd like get us into a frenzy talking about whatever. And it was literature, it was a bunch of you know, history, a bunch of different things. And then he would sort of lean back and kind of go like this. And we would all like, shh, shh, Reyes is mad, Reyes is mad, shh, shh. And we would shush ourselves and calm ourselves down. And then he'd crank us back up again. And it was, it was like this, this little rhythm in class. And I don't, I don't know that that was always what he was doing, but, but I, I remember as, as an adult, I got to visit BA and I got to sit in on his class and watch this happen. And as an adult, first of all, uh, it turned out that he wasn't a giant with a booming voice. It turned out he was about this tall to me. Um, <laughs> but but like this method was so full of love and so full of like attention and, and excitement that it really worked. And I, I was very happy to see it after the fact as, a, as an adult because it sure looks different. Um, I'd love to go back and... and... I, I just want to say thank you to you all and, and I'm... I wasn't expecting that to go off and take over everything, but I, I, I just appreciate all of your comments uh, so very much. So and it was a you. great contribution to the conversation, Scott. Thank you. And, I, and, and I'm sitting here thinking, okay, um, as we figure out what a learning quest looks like, how do we fuel exactly what you're doing here? And how do we, how do we help you instantiate it? How do we bring attention to it? How do we do the OGM kind of things around it? So uh, maybe we need to create a practice called OGM Jitsu. I don't know. Um, so, and, and I just, uh, for some reason, I wanted to put a, an article uh, that was a reflection on what happened to women during lockdown that I read yesterday. And I thought it was a really good article in the New York Times. And uh, basically the article says, hey, uh, as things locked down and as the social support systems failed, this fell heavily on women. And women had to step out of the workforce more. Uh, a lot of parts of the support system are going to stay pro broken and will not be there. And what, what you know, if, if feminism had achieved something, what did it achieve if it wasn't durable and where are we? Um, so I thought that was really interesting because, because lockdown has had a myriad effects that we're still figuring out and some of which we're still going to feel later um, as we get you know, cascading economic effects also of, of what's happening. Uh, so I thought that was, uh, that really struck me. And that's by, by far not the only lesson from 2020, but that one really kind of sticks in my mind. Go ahead, Scott. I had heard something recently on the big five personality model that related to this. And it had to do with your level of orderliness, which is a subset of conscientiousness. And the idea behind it was if you were 3% more orderly than your partner, you would notice things that had to be cleaned five minutes before they would, huh. which would mean that you would be the one who was always doing that. This describes our household perfectly. Right. And, well, and yet, ex but the idea was that you were you weren't at opposite ends of the spectrum. You were you were just slightly. It's they just were just slightly ahead. more sensitive, just a little bit more. And so the whole thing was like, well, if if you really if that's what how you're wired and that's what bothers you then then just accept it i need to i need to do this so that i feel feel good okay you know maybe it's not necessarily a i'm always doing this because you never do it well it's like well maybe it's just you didn't wait long enough <laughs> interesting go ahead julian um maybe this will ring a bell with somebody but i heard about someone who studied this and found, uh, for example, a friend of mine and his late wife were frequently at odds because, for example, somebody would, he would use something in the kitchen and then put it back. But the definition of put it back differed greatly between the two of them. For him, <laughs> if it was in the kitchen, he had put it back. And for her, it had to be in the kitchen in the right place. Right. 
And I heard that something about someone who studied this phenomenon and identified it. Maybe, maybe someone knows who that was. It uh, doesn't ring a bell for me. Um, but I'll it, ask it does remind me of a, a punchline that my business law professor had. He, said, he used to say, does the name Pavlov ring a bell? <laughs> um, sorry. <laughs> So let me go backwards through the grid here to see how we can check in on lessons from 2020 and take us wherever you want to on what you've picked up uh, from 2020. And I'll start with uh, Tom, Atley, and Mike, uh, who are, are not regulars in, in the group and are really, really welcome here uh, in our conversation. Thank you for, for being here. So let's go Tom, Mike, Klaus. Well, drag out from the crowd here. Uh, <laughs> um. I don't know. It's, I'm I'm in such a personal transition. It's hard to uh, hard to describe the mixture of uh, more vivid climate stuff. I was right next to some fires that were moving in our direction for a while, um, and and of course the <clears throat> the weather and the fires elsewhere and the reading about what's going on with fires. I mean, fires are changing in their character qualitatively. You know, fire, fire, NATO's reaching thirty thousand feet into the air, kind of it's like what? The oh. fuck? You know, uh, and the you know firefighters are trying to figure out how to predict things anymore. All the algorithms, their models they're working with, don't fit what's happening in front of them, uh, and that's not just a piece of it. Combined with the uh, with the very weird year in uh, the political social dynamics, um, which makes me, I mean, I've, lots of people go, yay, Biden won, so everything's cool. And going, no, <laughs> stuff, <laughs> this stuff has been bubbling for a long time. And it's, it's like the volcano, you know, it's like finally some pressure has been let off and it's plopping out and it's like, whoa. It's a toxic stew. Yes. <clears throat> uh, and there's, you know, people go, well, there's plenty of opportunity for trans transformation. And I go, yep, in all sorts of directions. <laughs> this is not necessarily a blessing. There'll be lots of butterflies flapping in this, in this tsunami, whatever. Uh, and also being in touch with people like uh, <clears throat> Michael Dowd, <clears throat> Jim Bendel, who are into the, you know, collapse trying to... Uh, understand what's happening with societal collapse and what that means in terms of how to live a, a decent, meaningful, contributory life. Uh, and my, my central work has been the exploration of collective wisdom, particularly as applied to communities and societies and the, uh, and lots of ideas, the whole pattern language on how to how to further that. But I realized as I watched things sort of coming apart that a lot of my uh, suggestions are based on, are based on what, uh, what we already have, you know, on the kinds of connectivity and, and resources and whatever, and that those might not be around. So the next question is what does the pursuit of collective wisdom, how do you do that in a society where there's increasing disorder, less resources, uh, people's habits and you know ways of being safe in the world are being challenged right and left. And it's just like, I don't know. Uh, and there's a lot of interesting people doing work in the field. So I'm sort of in a largely learning mode while I'm stumbling along, transforming what I think and trying to, it's like, I just, doing an end of year fundraiser and it's like, how do you, how do you raise money? How do you get people to give you money when you don't know what you're doing? <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's like a very strange, strange yin. And my own life has been seriously disrupted with my semi-distanced um, partner who I see every few months kind of. <clears throat> uh, so I don't, I don't know. I don't know. The, the, the learnings has, has a sense of, oh, that's what's going on. And here's, here's where I've come to in that. And I don't, you know, retrospectively, I just look at the, at my own world and the larger world coming apart 
lots of really creative stuff being done. I like to say things are getting better and better, worse and worse, faster and faster. But the uh, the worse and worse is pretty intense, and the better and betters are held back both by outside forces and by assumptions that people who are doing the better and betters carry along with them. Uh, so the limit to how far you can stretch into the over the edge kind of, uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm in a thoughtful, puzzled place and that will just have a mirror image of that will go up for what I expect for next year. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I'll have a big epiphany in the next week and be certain about what I would say. Anyway, thank, thanks for having me. I have, you know, danced around this space for uh, a while. I had a long talk with Charlie yesterday and he, he told me to show up here, so I am Jack. Thank you very much. Um, what you're saying resonates really strongly for me too. Just the the sense of things are getting better and better, worse and worse, faster and faster, et cetera. And, and the possibilities on the downside are just crazy, scary, and dangerous. Uh, and it feels like more intense than usual. Um, yeah. So the fire analogy works really well for what's happening socially as well. Mm -hmm. We're having social wildfires that are that are sort of um, out of control in ways that didn't happen before because our we have super connectivity all of a sudden. You know, uh, it, it, uh, long ago I've forgotten I've forgotten what year this was said, but uh, you know, um, a lie can <laughs> travel around the world eight times before the truth gets its pants on. Right, uh, and that was that was pre-internet era. It was Mark Twain. Mark it was Twain. Twain. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, the fires, as Tom described, them, they're both metaphorical and literal. So. Yes, right. Yeah. That was very definitely. It was the it was the reality of them that got to me, and the fact I, I thought, okay, the fire the firefighters are working harder because there's so many fires ago. No, the firefighters are trying to figure out how to do anything like what they used to do with the new conditions, which is metaphorically also. I noticed this year that the, a new term got introduced in the firefighting, which was complex. You know, for example, near me was the Santa Cruz complex. It wasn't right. just a fire anymore. Right, right. And the fact that these these fire nados, it's it's like um, you know the oh, you're not in Kansas anymore. You know, it's just a, it raises up stuff. It tears trees out by the roots and takes houses and stuff with it and all that. All of which are burning and then throws them far away. So it's like that's part of the complex. Is it's starting new fires elsewhere. Mm -hmm in ways that didn't used to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, fires used to progress and now they just spread like, you know, dandelions kind of, which is a different reality. And this may be the tip of the edge of climate change, natural disasters. <laughs> this, Maybe. May the, this, may, this may be the start of a whole new set of category of, of <laughs> nature uh, mm -hmm. run amok. Yeah. Well, I was and I have a friend in England, and he's you know he's in lockdown for this new virus, and the and the uh, the um, Johnson had put a new a new level of you know extreme kind of code red. This is now a code that's above that in the sense that they're I've heard already that they're putting make preparing new uh, levels of force for hurricanes, and now tornadoes. It's like we need to have higher things in order to measure it it's off the edge of our measuring sticks we're turning the knob to 11. <clears throat> yeah right um, and there was on the social effect. side we never had a um we've never had a president who ignored it and and you know like there was no expression of oh my gosh this is terrible we got to do something it's like well you need to rake your forests you know it's california is not managing their forests properly i i just was this the fire the social fire there is is also amazing <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And, go ahead, go ahead, Charles. In a sense, oh, uh, go ahead, I was just going to say there was an yeah, actual okay. volcano um, eruption on the big island of Hawaii, and we heard about it a little bit firsthand, uh, Lauren and I, in a, in a meeting the other night. But it was um, it was actually on the solstice at the same time as the the, the Saturn Jupiter conjunction, and yes, there was a a, a a volcano actually waking up right then, in the moment. So that's there you go. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Tom. Yeah, part of my learning, um, learning, unlearning last year at the social level, I mean, it's like the extent, and they talk about your know, money is just agreement and all this sort of things. And it's just like, yeah, right, but it's such a solid agreement. And they, 
what happened in our political, you know, democratic institutions is learning just how much it's just an agreement mm -hmm. and realizing how little agreement there was at the moment and how close we came to just toppling over the edge. And that edge is still there waiting to be toppled over. It's, you know, how the next, you know, years unfold as things get worse economically, environmentally, whatever, trying to have some sort of orderly politics has become increasingly increasingly difficult which is both a blessing and a curse but mm -hmm. i mm -hmm. really got that you know we've been <laughs> my whole life as an activist kind of been pounding my head against these solid institutions and going they are not solid and that's it's like the soviet union collapsing it's like okay people said well communist capitalism could collapse just like that i go well yeah and i go well yeah <laughs> it's it's very how to reorient in the space where that level of change is possible at any moment is is uh challenging to say the least totally agree thank you tom um let's go mike klaus lauren and here's mike in my brain thank you jerry um sorry to join late and sorry not to be able to join more often um nice to have you here I was hanging out outside. We had an electrician here trying to rewire our house, which was not wired properly, apparently. Um, I'm going to be pretty brief and try to summarize just a few of the discoveries this year. Uh, I don't think everybody knows what I do for a living, but Jerry and I have known each other for more than 25 years, and we've both been trying to make the internet better. Him by helping the innovators and me by trying to stop the politicians from getting in the way of the innovators. And so my current job, and this is my eighth dream job, is working at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, working with governments and policymakers and corporate people and thinkers around the world. And my focus has really been a lot more on words you know, I'm a, I'm a physicist by training. So most of my career, I've been the guy in the room who says, this is the future technology. This is what's happening in the lab, or this is what's happening at some startup. And this is how it's going to change things. Don't miss it up. And I've been doing that for many years. Well, it used to be the political process didn't want to miss up the future. And now they don't give a damn. And it's really frustrating, and, and partly because it's about public relations and PR and partisanship now. And as a result, I've kind of changed my focus from trying to point to the future. And instead, I'm trying to craft some better words, better memes. I mean, we have these incredible bumper stickers that are shaping policy right now. One example is intellectual property, the whole idea that a Britney Spears album is the same as a car. But the more, more serious ones are things like data is the new oil. This is one of the most destructive ones that I've had to deal with. And I talked to policymakers from Pakistan to Belgium to South Africa, and they, they have adopted this because it was on the front page of The Economist three and a half years ago. And they think of it as the strategic asset and they have to hold on to it. And they don't understand that information is power. Information sharing is far more powerful. So trust is the new oil, not data. Mm -hmm. And we've got to change that mindset. We've just got to get past that because it's the difference between hoarding and sharing and combining. Uh, so data is the new air. That's, that's my attempt. I'm looking for something else that works better, but air flows across borders. It can be used and reused. If it gets polluted, you can clean it up. So that, that, that's one of the many things I'm trying to work on right now. And, and the way I'm doing this is I've got a memo on the, the seven thorny questions. These are the big, powerful problems in digital policy that are not getting resolved. And that's what I'm trying to focus on. And I'm trying to get the vision and the words right. So I'm not doing the economic analysis. I'm not a lawyer, but instead for encryption, for data protection, for connecting the unconnected, 
I'm trying to lay out what the real issue is. And, and in some of these cases, the real issue is a matter of values. Is it more important that we protect all of society or is it more important that we protect our individual liberties and our, our individual privacy? And these are fundamental values choices that the countries are not willing to make. They keep thinking that they can do everything. You know, we can have total surveillance, know all, where all the bad guys are, but we can have absolute privacy. <laughs> so this, this kind of collision is, is something that has to be addressed. And so I'm trying to come up with some words that make people think differently about these choices and to sort of start with the, the campaign speech and go from there. So that, that's been, it's been hard for a physicist. I, I did spend three years at Georgetown teaching in the communications culture and technology program. And the communications people and the, and, the, and the anthropologists convinced me very quickly that what they do is a lot harder and more nebulous than the technology. But pulling it together is even more complicated. And that's what we're trying to do. I resonate with what Tom says. That's another thing I learned is that no one wants to fund the important problems if it benefits everybody. I mean, I'm trying to get funding for some of these projects and it's just, it's really hard because it doesn't benefit one company over another. And everybody agrees, this is really important stuff. I'm sure somebody will fund it. So that's been an important finding. But uh, on a personal level, uh, I've also done a lot of growing this year. Uh, Kathleen and I celebrated being together 10 years, 10 days ago. And we went away for a romantic weekend in a, in a little town nearby, one of these overlooked places that nobody goes to, in, unless you're in COVID and you can't fly anywhere. And we had a wonderful weekend and, um, and I got engaged. So after 10 years, we decided hey. it was time. Hey. Oh, Mike, so congratulations. It was really wonderful. So in a, in a, in a yurt at a brewery on a farm. <laughs> But awesome. the coolest thing about it was, besides the fact that we're going to live together for the rest of our life, the coolest thing was that through social media, we made so many people happy. I mean, people, even people who weren't close friends, but everybody was kind of amused by the way we did it and just so excited for us. And, and, and that, was, that, was, that was powerful. That is awesome. I, I, I think that's, that's another use of of our lives is to bring joy to other people. And that's, I can picture that's, Lizzie as the flower girl. <laughs> well, it's going to be a Zoom wedding, so you'll be yeah. able to see it. Throwing flowers but, uh, on the screen. Those are, those are some reflections. And the, other, the only other thing I would add is that um, both Kathleen and I have invested quite a bit in, in executive coaches this year. You know, we're not going to do it for the rest of our life, but you know, every so often you get stuck and, and you get stuck in mindsets. And it's exactly the same as my policymaker friends who have it in their head that, you know, the internet just moves bits. They don't understand it's now a giant computer that's processing and storing bits. They, if, if you get ideas in your head and no one challenges them, then you don't move forward. And I, I, I wish I could find a cheaper way to do that than an executive coach. So I'm, I'm looking for looking for suggestions on that. So yeah. I'm gonna sign off. I'm not gonna sign off, but I'm gonna shut up. Um, I know I got a lot out of the discussion earlier and look forward to, to joining you more often. And I'm really looking forward to next week because I'm the futurist and I'm pretty excited about 2021, not just because we have some competent leadership in Washington, but because I do think we can turn some things around. So thanks for the opportunity to, to, to talk and I'm happy. If anybody wants to find me, uh, Twitter is a great place to follow me at Mike Nelson on Twitter. And if you'll post the seven, uh, the seven thorny questions piece when you've got it done, if you'll post it to the OGM list or whatever, that'd be great. We'd love to, we'd love to read it. It will never be done, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I can share the, the highlights. As a, as a work in progress, if you, want, if you want comments on a Google doc or something as you're writing it, post it and we'll, you know, people will jump in. So that'd be great. I'm going to do that. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Klaus, Lauren, Eric. Yeah, 2020 has been, uh, has been an interesting year on so many different levels. <clears throat> I mean, I spent the last six years trying to convince uh, people that uh, without addressing agriculture and the food system, you can't solve the climate system. 
and it's finally maturing. You know, it's uh, um, so many people have uh, joined in uh, in organizations uh, and and uh, uh, even even eat the Eat Lancet group, which has done so much damage uh, in the beginning with. Uh, this is why we have uh, lab core meat and the impossible burger has come around to really look at uh, food in the context of nature now uh, and you can't uh, solve uh, what we have done to nature by growing uh, lab uh, meat in the labs um, I'm, I'm preparing for uh, pre-meetings pre with the panels for uh, the movie showing Kiss the Crown, you know, we, we have uh, the movie directors and the founder of the organization in one meeting and so it's a really interesting panels on, on uh, one with the Sierra Club and one with Citizen Climate Lobby. So I'm, uh, I'm thinking about how to prepare the conversation and sort of nudge the conversation into specific directions and in the process I'm thinking um, what a mess this is. I mean, when you look at the food system, the further you step back, right, the more you realize this is a complete market failure. I mean, this is a classic market failure. Uh, what we are facing today, you have a food system where 20% of the population uh, have no access to fresh food. You know, 20%, one in six children grows up food insecure. Uh, stunted for life, you know, for lack of nutrition and, uh, and, and living in poverty. Yeah. When you look at the inner cities of the US and abandoned communities throughout rural America, you realize what a complete mess this is. You know, there, there are companies that have put a factory employing 10,000 people out of a community of 100,000 and just were left. You know? And, and crash the entire community behind. Mm -hmm. So it really started, uh, I think, under Reagan. And the, the, the design, uh, focusing the, the design imperative for, uh, for corporate development has been completely focused on profit. And the, 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 without any uh, consideration for the social impact of their decisions. In fact, openly stating that's not our problem. And you go, well, whose problem is it, right? If you have the same companies who reject any uh, input on what are the social needs of the economy that, that the economy has to fulfill, and at the same time influence the political process to not do anything that harms their profits, I mean, that's how you end up with a mess. And this is where we are right now. It's a complete mess. Uh, the, uh, the damage this system does to the natural world with the chemically intensive form of, of growing food uh, is incomprehensible. It is incomprehensible when you think that the Gulf of Mexico has dead zones that are hundreds of miles deep, right? Um, I mean, how, is, how, how, can, how can, could we have allowed this? It's unfathomable, right? So this is where I came to in 2020 uh, is uh, uh, this is going to kill us. I mean, this is going to absolutely destroy us if we don't get a handle on it. And it unfortunately has become uh, a lot more critical than it had to be because five years ago, this could have been easily fixed. If Eat Lancet and all these corporations, you know, who were uh, uh, got, got garnered around the World Council had decided that uh, uh, the, the protein they need for vegan foods should also come from sources that are regenerative to nature, we could have made a huge impact, but they didn't. You know, they, no one paid attention to where that comes from. So I think 2021 is, uh, is the year where we will, I mean, going to the future, but where we will uh, have to address those issues. You know? So to me, this, uh, I, I keep talking about the densification of knowledge, right? The more dense our knowledge is, the more simple our language becomes, right? Because uh, a, a word then becomes so much more meaningful because it has so much behind it. And I think that's where we are moving to, you know, we, we, uh, um, we begin to really understand this. And the, 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 the other hand side, on the other side, of course, <clears throat> market, uh, market capitalism is unquestioningly 
the best form of uh, of uh, guiding an e or letting an economy grow and 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 uh, satisfy needs. But there has to be some direction to it, right? There, there has to be there, there have to there has to be a regulatory frame that moves an economy forward with restraints and with specific designed outcomes. And, and uh, you see that in countries like Denmark and Germany, I mean, there are designed outcomes, you know, social democracies function, mm -hmm. function just fine. And, and so here has what has uh, metastasized you know, in the 90s, particular 80s, 90s, is this idea that the market will self-regulate, that the market will find best possible outcomes uh, and when you, when we look at the bottom 50% of the population, how people struggle, you know, how they are constrained with debt, and uh, then, then that's really not the market any reasonable conscious person would design. Right? So there was no design involved here. Uh, you know, it's, it's a free fall. So anyway, <clears throat> that's sort of uh, my thought process for 2020. Thank you, Klaus. Uh, what's the name of the company you mentioned earlier? I thought I heard E-Lancet. Eat Lancet, E-A-T. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, Eat Lancet. They, they, I mean, they, they, the, the World Bank, you know, the, the, uh, the Economic uh, the Council where Bill Gates and everybody is hanging in. And uh, uh, there was a McKinsey study that uh, came out uh, in 2018, 2017. Um, where um, they uh, uh, advocated a high-tech solution to agriculture, um, and when you and I, I can I post it in a moment. I can I can show you the the, the, the article that summarizes these studies, completely focused on on uh, technology uh, and uh, uh, looking at solving the problem of so many animals by let's just call protein uh, in the lab uh, and uh, use plants. Well, uh, no one thought about, okay, so where does your protein, your plant-based protein input come from? Well, it comes from China, which sources uh, soy from Brazil, cutting down the Amazon rainforest in the process. You know, I mean, so, so there was just a, a complete lack of uh, using design criteria you know, that is a holistic approach to solving mm -hmm. such a traumatic problem. And, uh, and they got away with it, right? And so, so it wasn't that there was a whole group of, uh, of you know, fellow travelers of mine here who, and, and also, you know, the, and the, the good thing is that NGOs are finally coming together, uh, looking at a common reality instead of fighting uh, this one cave over there, or, or I mean, like Michael, level uh, uh, projects, now we are, we are looking at this more from a systemic perspective. So now uh, we, are, we are formulating a challenge to the incoming Secretary of Agriculture, Vilsack, you know, because he worked for Obama for eight years, making more of a mess, right? And so now is this the same guy coming in doing what? You know, more of the same, obviously, you know, that can't happen. So um, uh, we're, we're forcing a dialogue on where do you expect to go? I mean, what do you see needs to be fixed here? Yeah. Uh, so it's this kind of systems thinking that breaks through by understanding the food system on a macro level. You know, if you move up on the macro level and you go, man, we have uh, uh, like 40 million people who don't have a grocery store inside you know, to, to, uh, to buy uh, uh, some fresh food or, or some produce. So, how do we fix this? Uh, because mm -hmm. we have to start at the bottom. And this is actually, when you think about it, I mean, the entire, the essence of New Testament thinking is that you have to take care of the poor, right? I mean, that's, and, and, and the Christians overcame the Roman Empire by focusing on the poor, uh, because that's where, uh, by, by helping, genuinely helping, that's where society revitalizes itself and rejuvenates itself. Thank you. And uh, we're clearly not going to make it through everybody, but we're in a really good discussion. So thank you. Uh, let's go Lauren, Eric, Julian. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, Merry Christmas. I'm glad Merry Santa's Christmas. here. <laughs> so on Monday, we did, uh, we did an OGM circle appreciation over at uh, Kiko Lab. And um, 
Yeah, it was really great. And sometimes when we do these circle appreciations, um, some people emerge as really uh, much stronger than I think that uh, we give them credit for. And um, I'm really excited to uh, tell you that uh, one of these, these people who really emerged on Monday was uh, Marc-Antoine Parron. And I just wanted to, uh, I, I, we take these circle appreciations and I turn them into video profiles. So I just wanted to share that with you today. So I hope you don't mind. Thanks a lot, by the way, Lauren, for this process. This was so, 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 uh, <laughs> I'm still, I'm still reeling under it, but I, I wasn't the only one to emerge and definitely. Uh, no, you weren't, but it's strong. <laughs> definitely. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jerry, let's, Jerry. let's watch. Let's watch. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but uh, I do want to say, I mean, I'm now very sorry I was absent when you were fated in that process. <laughs> <laughs> There'll be another one. There'll be another one. Here we go. Who's Mark Antoine runs way deep. You can hear it? So when you start talking about, uh, about his projects, when you sort of go into hyper knowledge and, and, and so forth, and you realize that he's trying really hard to model everything that's involved in how we think and express things to each other, including how do I break down nuances and sort of dive deeper so that we might actually be able to have these conversations with one another assisted by technology that, that is busy mapping and holding all of these things we think and, and do and, and how it all unpacks. And, and the level of depth came up on a list recently where he and Steve Newcomb were sort of going back and forth uh, on, um, uh, totally above my pay grade levels of, of how semantics work and what is going on when you do deep analysis. And it was just a, it was a master's class, just reading through this email thread as they were sort of replying to each other, uh, going through uh, this particular topic it was beautiful. What comes to mind to me is an iceberg. And, and here's why. Um, it's always in motion, but with a small, visible face that's rising up out of the water into the sun. But it's stabilized and supported by this incredible mass below the surface. He's not a hacker. So he's not like the kind of person who's like, what's just the easiest way that I can do something? Marc Antoine is going to be like, what is the best way that I can do it. When I heard him talk, I thought, oh my gosh, I want to know this guy. So I pinged him. I told him that I was going to be in Dubrovnik in a couple of weeks. And that's, and he asked why. And I said, because, you know, Karabeg and I were running this biannual event called uh, Knowledge Federation Conference at the university in, in Dubrovnik. Well, lo and behold, Marc Antoine bought a ticket and showed up in Dubrovnik and uh, attended the event. And I asked him to steward one of the sessions and he did it masterfully. It was at that point that I began to realize that Marc Antoine was, he was a keeper as some, some people would say. Marc Antoine really knows what he's talking about. He goes really- Lauren, really could you really mute your mic? Knowledge, the merging of knowledge. I feel like the Hubble telescope, like, wow, it looks black in there, but there's these billions and billions of galaxies that are like really deep and bright. And um, I was very thrilled to, to be in conversation with you. I believe Marc Antoine has a series of clones, like a clone army, because he has really large projects of his own that he's busy trying to bring to fruition. And yet he participates with insane generosity in places like Free Jury's Brain and Open Global Mind. And he's completely on board with listening to, to other people's perspectives and trying to help them on their journey. He's not, he's a person with a huge journey of his own who's not obsessed by that journey and overtaken by the journey. It's always very inspiring to see somebody just cranking out work and just chugging along. And like every, in the Free Jerry's Brain initiative in, in uh, OGM, he's been just adding consistent you know, pieces to a, to a, to some software that are, that's making continual progress. And he's not afraid to take on big things and actually um, just day by day, just take on a little bit and a little bit 
and he kind of like keeps doing stuff. Uh, I hope to join in, join in on that velocity with you and, and put my shoulder on the same on the same stone soon enough. And he joined Topic Quest's board of directors, and so he is while he has his own enterprise and his own business, he is a part of the functioning of the Topic Quest Foundation. And he and I have formed a partnership, which is another kind of an entity that intersects his work and the Topic Quest Foundation's work. He's very generous in how he relates to people. And I sometimes think that he has a gift for seeing the wisdom in other people's comments um, and shares that with the group and helps us see the talents of other people. He makes you feel understood um when you talk and like is always listening to try to understand what you're saying and um i'd like to thank him for his generosity of his time and expertise a really generous person he's generous with his time he helps people out he's a kind person and he, uh, this is his greatest quality is that you cannot be it doesn't matter how outlandish you are and 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 inarticulate he would be pushing me to explain what I'm trying to say. And he actually gets most, all of it. And it's just, it's just amazing. Finding, finding the signal through the noise, especially when talking about very complex topics. Um, and you know that because he asks the right questions. Observing the way that you think, I'm fascinated by it, the way people think. And, you know, you clearly have a lot of different maps and, and, and perspectives that you can jump around to and weave those in which a lot of people can do, but not everyone can do it so that it comes out coherently for the other people in the conversation. And that to me was really amazing. Like you just don't reach and grab something really down and go, okay, here's this. And people go, well, yeah, but what? You're like, people say, oh yeah, I totally see how that connects to this and this and this. And it was inspiring. I find him to be a quiet, thoughtful, deep thinker who then says something wise, but in a way that everybody can understand it which I think is a real gift because lots of people can think deeply but not articulate what they say. Uh, and for how technical he, he, he can get, it's pretty amazing how he can actually, you know, come up for air and explain what he's talking about to, to normal people as well. So you have strong opinions about stuff and you're coming into things with strong beliefs, but you're listening very carefully for how those beliefs might be challenged, might be changed. And I think that your, your neurons are wired softly enough that you could change them if you, if you felt like it, if you were convinced about something. And that's a, it's a beautiful thing. And so you're sort of a walking, talking, living, breathing example of what Open Global Mind wants to be, would like to do, the kind of person we would like to help, the, you know, all of those kinds of things. Mark Antoine is someone that we all trust to be honest to be humble and to hold himself accountable sometimes he'll show up and he'll go i didn't do anything this week and it's also really wonderful to see like the the, the honesty what i would say sets him apart is that he is a man of quality there's an integrity to it it just you know it, it's not that this one little piece that you can see but it's attached to the whole thing they held the 50th anniversary of Doug Engelbart's uh, um, Mother of All dem Demos. Mark Antoine bought himself a ticket to Palo Alto. I picked him up at SFO. And we stayed in that town for a couple of days and attended that conference. This is a guy who quite literally puts his money where his mouth is. That's all I want to say. I also appreciate your humor and um, the, the lightness of your being. You just feel to me like somebody who is um, just having a good time, you know? I mean, it's, it's just, it's, it's really fun to hang out with you and I look forward to more of that. I really appreciated our interactions and your incisiveness, intuition, observations. I am just, uh, you know, up to the gunnels with praise for you and the way you approach and show up <laughs> Thank you, Lauren. Yeah, Lauren rocks. It was and, embarrassing uh, the first time. <laughs> the second time is even more embarrassing. I, so you, all Lauren. the all the movie theaters are empty right now. So I understand it's going to be screened around the world 
uh, in movie theaters, right? Unfortunately, empty movie theaters, is that right? Twitter theaters. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, thank you for those of you who have to drop off uh, and we'll go to the half and then, uh, and then wrap this call. But Mike, thanks for joining up. Well, I could. Um, Lauren, do you want to add anything about lessons from 2020? I mean, 20, yeah, 2020, that's the year win. Dang. Which will mercifully oh. be over soon? Um, no, I feel like I've taken up so much time already. That's, I'm good. I'm complete. No, no you had, you, 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 take, you took time with me. <laughs> take time with yourself. <laughs> Uh, well, I uh, I think one thing I just kind of learned was just to jump in and start doing stuff. And um, yeah, I think I think we're going to do that next Monday as well and try to take, uh, you know, Jerry's ideas of uh, the guild structure and play with that and use these deep profiles to kind of put people into roles and start just playing around on a board and seeing how far we get. Because I'm really excited about that idea, Jerry. I think it's really... Um, I, I was really inspired by your video, so. Cool, thank you. I'll, I'll try to be there. That sounds great. Um, uh, let's go to Eric, then Marc Antoine. See how far we get through the, to the half hour. Yeah, thanks. Nice to be here, first time. <laughs> yeah, um, no, switch the view so I can see. Um, so one of the most important things I learned about this year was actually last year, but today, uh, this year, I really went into it is IFS is internal family systems. Because the most complex system that I know, and I'm dealing with a lot of complex systems is myself, of course, because I'm everything and everything happens in me. And I think um, IFS gave me a way to actually be able to be with that, like, and not to just have it, having to be like one person that is has his like that somehow put together. I know I consist of a lot of different parts. That's kind of the essence of the system. It's just a it's a therapeutic modality for those who don't know. But it deals with how parts within yourself interact with each other. And for me, it was like, oh yes, finally something. It takes me a long while to find a suitable therapist and then to <laughs> arrange stuff, but. It's, it's a really nice thing that I've got this kind of perspective. Finally, I can make sense to myself, maybe. My um, wife is a uh, IFS couples therapist. Uh, is she? Yes. Really? Oh, fabulous. What's her, what's her name? Marla yeah. Silverman. Oh, really trained by Dick Schwartz. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, here you go. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, the other part, it happened during the call now, like, uh, Thanks, George, and here's to meet her. Um, so the other part is uh, walking, like actually during the call just before uh, my neighbor, she's a very good uh, non-violent communication trainer. It's a neighbor of my parents at my, at my, my parents' house during COVID and normally living in Amsterdam, but um, she invited me for walking. And actually that's what I've been doing a lot the last like months and you see a lot of people walking now it's amazing how many cars are in the parking lot uh of of like uh, uh, forests and stuff but for me it makes a huge difference actually and it's kind of a i get this wow i get a notification to update my flash player um so the <laughs> walking for me is like a uh a way and an indication that i really one of them that I really want to change my way of living. I don't know how to do it yet. I'm looking again at maybe moving back to a community like a eco village or something, but I'm not sure I actually want to be living in a city probably for the possibilities, but something I want to really change. It's more like looking forward. I think the third thing that I really want to name, it's gonna make absolutely no sense to you probably <laughs> right now or maybe a bit, um, but I'll explain it in another call probably. And I, I need to share my screen. It's this. So uh, I've been working a, on a, a kind of system. It's a, 
huge brainstorm and it started off 15 years ago and it's like creating something imagine the brain but then a social network and maybe many other more things but it's easiest if you just imagine the brain but then you work together and this this kind of outline is kind of how all the systems fit together and how to create like a collaboration system but something that really works and this is something that I created in the last couple of months and with this I could finally feel like oh yes finally it's fitting together like this is actually possible it's possible to create a system where people will collaborate in the hugest possible scale and um, it's yeah it's it's a uh, this is just one. I've got so many mind maps and UML, but this is actually one where I'm really proud of where I got it. Um, and um, it's maybe another part is, is yeah, this, but it, that doesn't mean anything unless I take a lot of time explaining it, but it's something like, um, yeah, no, that would take too much time. Have you recorded yourself explaining these? I would like to, but I think I can't do it by myself. I need someone with so, me doing that. So what you could do is we could set up OGM pop-up calls that are specifically for you to explain these diagrams. And anybody in OGM who wants to can show up. We can record them. You can post them. Wow. You can edit them. You mm. can do whatever. That's a piece of cake, piece of cake. And I think that <clears throat> I think that having an, a, a tiny audience of people who are like really intrigued will, is the perfect combo for you to, to actually talk it through. Wow. And then they will <laughs> ask you questions that, because they're seeing it for the first time, they will ask yeah. you questions you may not have thought to explain up front. So I think that'll work really yeah, well. Yeah, I'd love that to happen. And the, um, that's also something that, um that happened is that i met you like this well like in in two weeks time i met so many initiatives that are similar to mine and i've been looking for this like for my whole life it seems or a big part of my life and now i'm finally here in I, this group I, so you you connected with me and i started googling you and looking at my like holy crap like like you know sense weavers i uh, <laughs> you know, the collective sense making the mind mapping and all this kind yeah, of stuff yeah. like you, know, you are like a soul brother so come on in yeah and it's funny i, I also saw about your brain i thought yeah that's just just a guy with a lot of thoughts in his brain. <laughs> like just a lot of things that interest him but i wasn't realizing that he might be like-minded but then when i saw you on the call also on monday and stuff and then started looking yeah i understood oh yeah that's really someone yeah so, so I, let's, i'm really yeah so let's make room to um, draw out the story of what you've built. And uh, 2021 is right here. We can start doing that. Thank um, you. <laughs> thank you, Eric. Um, Marc-Antoine? I'll try to go fast because <clears throat> we're coming to the half hour. I was wondering what I'd say because so many things happened in 2020. And Eric gave me a good hint by speaking about the multiple identities. and. I've been thinking about, I mean, I've been trying to get, gain perspective on my own work and I'm trying to make sure that, you know, we all have understandings and they all have a kind of so-so coherency and consistency. And then we try to align them with social understanding, which have their own. And now the problem is we're in these uh, limited groups so we can afford to, to have much higher consistency with a much smaller group. And this is how bubbles are born. And I think it's very important that we all keep having multiple identities because this is how we, it's by belonging to many bubbles that we manage to not be prisoner of one bubble. Uh, and and, and being, a, being forced to always align our limited viewpoint with different viewpoints in different fields is how we create, again, overlapping consensus and all these means of humanizing uh, people who have a very different standpoint. So yeah, this is for um, the diversity of being as a key antidote to the polarization of, the 20, of 2020. Thank you. Um, I, and I'm noting just from this call that OGM is kind of a, a, a strange attractor not quite literally, but interestingly, for people who thought long and hard about how things work and who are trying to create solutions to those, the, the issues that show up. 
Um, and so, so we've heard of, you know, Scott started us off with, with his passion project and where that's unfolding. Uh, Tom and community have done the wise democracy pattern language, uh, which runs way, way deep. Uh, Eric just explained his work, you know, on this for, for a long time, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and so there, are, and, and uh, George and I just met very recently and George has a, a model like this as well. Um, and so, uh, so. I think, and maybe this is where we pick up uh, next week, I think one piece of what we can do together, um, because I'm aware that when you've crystallized and worked really hard to get to what feels like the right model, and then you meet people who have neighboring models that are not quite the same, that, that's like a, it's a moment of both, oh shit, and oh good, right? And, and I'm really interested in how we, how these models have sex. Like, like how do our idea frameworks get better by being mashed up against other people's idea frameworks and then get absorbent enough to sort of share some DNA, but don't get, don't become the unified single model, but sort of get richer because I think we need multiple perspectives into the giant hairball that is how we think and what society is and you know, how we fix stuff in the world. We need lots of, lots of different sort of perspectives into it, but how do we improve each of our perspectives? <laughs> exactly, Eric. Um, how, do we, how do we improve each of our perspectives? And then how do we instrument them? How do we propagate them? How do we you know, connect them to other peoples? And, and the ones that are really near to each other might actually sort of uh, just sort of merge. Um, uh, I'm no biologist, but the mitochondria that create energy in our cells used to be a bacterium that was outside and basically got incorporated. So it was a, a, an early act of symbiosis that created the energy mechanism that powers uh, animal cells. That's kind of cool. Um, and that happened, uh, great, you know, thankfully long ago. So we don't have to worry about it coming apart right now. Uh, that would be embarrassing. Um, but, but how can our ideas have symbiotic acts like that? So uh, Lynn Margulies, I think, was the, the, the biologist who sort of came up with these theories of symbiosis. And, and, and she was really, uh, she's one of my con favorite contrarians. And she was running against the natural sort of scientific theories that, you know, nature is nasty, is uh, red in tooth and claw, and it's all about competition and, and uh, Darwinian evolution and, uh, you know, uh, all, the, all that kind of thing. And it's like, no, no, no wait, there's all this other really complicated and super interesting stuff going on, which metaphorically, and this is a gentler use of metaphor than our use of fire earlier, um, is, might be the way that we can sort of move forward uh, going into things. So I've, I've run us over the, the half hour, but um, I think this might be a nice place to pick up uh, next Thursday. Uh, I'll see some of you in between, but uh, right now we have uh, Christmas looming for those of you who celebrate Christmas. And I wanna wish you um, a really heartfelt Christmas because you, this has been uh, this has been a wonderful year for me because of this group, um, and almost entirely because of this group and our activities together and our hopes for the future and our sharing of them in this sort of incredible way that Lauren manages to edit and give back to us as a gift uh, and, uh, and things like that. So uh, happy holidays and uh, I'll post this video as we usually do. So you, you've got it as a record, but thank you. Thank you for, for being here very much. We got church bells in Zurich over here. Oh my God, that's so perfect. <laughs> that's <appropriate>. That is <laughs> so perfect. I'm surrounded. Thank Much you all. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Take care. Take care, everybody. All the best.